Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say happy birthday to the Council House and happy birthday to the Nottingham Trent Creative Writing Program. So happy, two happy birthdays here before we start. So I want to welcome you to the Nottingham UNESCO City of Literature Annual Lecture for 2019. We're delighted to have combined this event with the International Notwich Cities of Literature event. And I'd like to welcome all of those who've joined us online through the live broadcast of this event and thank Confetti and Nottingham Trent University in association with Nottingham City of Literature and the University of Nottingham for enabling the live broadcast this evening. So I'm Shira West, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Nottingham and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's lecture. This annual public lecture aims to provide a platform for leading writers and thinkers to share their ideas and promote Nottingham City's wide-ranging expertise on international literature, literacy, and the wider creative economy to audiences locally, nationally, and internationally. UNESCO is 72 years old, its declared purpose is to contribute to the building of peace, the eradication of poverty, sustainable development, and intercultural dialogue through education, the sciences, culture, communication, and information. The UNESCO Cities of Literature Network of 28 cities represents six continents in 23 countries. The network brings together over 1,000 libraries, 70 literary festivals, and over 900 bookshops. As is evidenced by this Notwich event and your presence here tonight, the UNESCO Cities of Literature work together and build strong global partnerships, encouraging literary exchanges, creating cross-cultural initiatives, and developing local, national, and international literary links. Tonight's lecture comes exactly four years since the Nottingham, another birthday, City of Literature's bid team submitted the first outline application and waited to hear if the UNESCO UK office would support Nottingham's application. Apart from ultimately achieving the UNESCO designation, perhaps the most impressive thing about the process of bidding and the positive outcome has been the continued partnership between the universities the City Council, and the City's leading arts organizations to ensure that the designation is a success. This partnership is generous in spirit and allows each organization to flourish within the City of Literature framework. And to reach out to the City's residents, whether their back, whatever their background, to offer new opportunities to engage with literature and creativity, enhancing lives, and enabling individuals to actively participate in the creative economy. For the University of Nottingham, these relationships are an important part of our civic mission, but they're also an important part of our research culture and how we engage with wider society. The global nature of the Creative Cities Network is exciting to us as it provides an opportunity for us to communicate and collaborate across the globe with cities and organization with shared values of education, the sciences, and culture as a critical part of a healthy society. As a city that has global aspirations, it's fitting that we have a world-leading author to help us think about the connections between literature and aspects of UNESCO's mission. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Robert McFarlane back to Nottingham a city that he knows well or knew well, um, having been to school here for many years and grown up just outside the city, but I was speaking to Robert earlier and this is a visit back, a first visit back for some time. Robert is a British writer and fellow of Emmanuel College, Cambridge. He's best known for his books on landscape, nature, place, people and language. His best-known works being The Old Ways, 2012, Landmarks, 2015, The Lost Words, 2017, and his latest work, Underland, was published on the 2nd of May, and you can buy a copy just outside the door, and I recommend that you do that. 
and Robert might even sign it for you. <laughs> so, in 2017, he received the E.M. Forster Award for Literature from the American Academy of Arts and Science of Letters in collaboration with the director, Jen Piedom, the cinematographer, Renan Ozturk, and the composer, Richard Tognetti. McFarlane worked on the film Mountain, which premiered with a live performance from the Australian Chamber Orchestra at the Sydney Opera House in June 2017. Mountain became the highest grossing Australian documentary of all time and won three Australian Academy Awards. So before we hand over to Robert, I'd like to welcome Patrick Lim, a trustee of the Nottingham City of Literature, to introduce Nottinghamshire's Lost Words campaign. Patrick. Robert will, I hope, uh, forgive me for saying that his abundant talents do not extend to drawing. Uh, for that, he needed Jackie Morris, a magician of brushstroke and painted line. And for her part, Jackie needed Robert to lie down in his word hoard to bring back a treasury of spells. Above all, though, we needed them and their all-too-timely collaboration, The Lost Words. Uh, here uh, is a rare edition without its title, The Lost Words, well, poignantly, strikingly lost. Robert's day job uh, is dedicated to the teaching of young people from diverse backgrounds. He is, I believe, at heart, an educator. And what Robert and Jackie were educating us about is loss, that is, the loss of the names of nature, including from the Oxford Junior Dictionary, a loss made all the more concerning because a dictionary is, of course, meant to be an instrument of education. By their book, they both identified that loss and chose to repudiate it. The Lost Words was, in essence then, by Robert's collaboration of the wild, celebration of the wild words of nature with Jackie's pictures, a call to action against a loss. Uh, crucially, the loss is risked by no longer using the names of nature. In Rob's own words, uh, unimprovable words, we find it hard to love what we cannot give a name to, and what we do not love, we will not save. We, as a UNESCO city of literature, were proud to answer that call. Carol as volunteer, Matt as communications officer, myself as a trustee, addressing literacy, a literacy of the natural uh, world uh, included is at the heart of our city of literature's mission. This book then, born of collaboration, gave rise to a collaborative campaign. Uh, some inspirationally had preceded our one with Scotland leading the way, others have followed since. And so we have for you, Robert, a short film made also for Jackie, she may be watching now by live stream, about the, how the lost words for Knott's crowdfunder developed here in Nottingham. The music you will hear is the blessing from the lost words spell songs. The kids you will see are from Heathfield Primary. Please accept this as our welcome, our Nottingham welcome, back to the city where you too were once a pupil. Of the blue black jacket and the boxer swagger. 
Set the stream alight with glitter May you enter now a saunter Without falter into water Atta Ever dreamed of being an Atta? Look to the sky with care, my love And speak the things you see In a bluebell wood, on the branch, below the Below is blue, so deep, sea deep, sea deep Journey on past dying I stars. I am Ivy, a real high flyer. But I am walking stone. I scale the tree and spire. You call me ground cover. I say sky fire. Find the gleaming eye of starling, like the little aviator. Sing your heart to all dark matter. Heaven. Hair haunt heaven, hair haunt heaven, huge hinge heaven, grey ringed weapon, weapon, weapon. Weasel, weasel whirls through whirl like wildfire. Ember spins smoke curls for weasel. Axe on lamb like sparks on tinder. Newt. You toe newt, you are too cute. Promoted the cute to the too cute newt. Let your names take a root and thrive and grow. And even as you stumble through matter sands eroding, let the fair unfurl you grieving. Let the heron still. Silky swim you deeper, oh my little silver seeker. Even as the hour grows bleaker, be the singer and the speaker. And in city and in forest, let the larks become your chorus. And when every hope is gone, let the raven call you. Oh dear, it's, uh, it's a terrible thing to do, to reduce your speaker to tears, <laughs> before he's even begun. Um, I, I, um, I, am, I am not dry-eyed. Um, that was uh, for a writer to see one's world, words go into the world, to see Jackie's art go into the world, and find their ways into the minds and hearts and lives and stories of children is about as good as it gets. And being involved with The Lost Words, which has become something far bigger and wilder and stranger than the book or than us, it's become a, a community, a global community of people wanting to make change. It's, it's the greatest privilege of my life, nothing like it will ever happen again. And I thank here today everyone who's been involved with, with that in Nottingham, all of the librarians and the teachers, and of course the volunteers and the visionaries. So much generosity has made that happen. So I thank you all so much. I feel, in a way, my work here is done because what? <laughs> sorry, this, the mic's, mic's popping a bit. If there's any way of calming the pops, that would be wonderful. But if not, I'll try not to use any peas in a highly experimental siege. <clears throat> <clears throat>
All right, let me begin properly. Good evening to you all. Thank you so much for being here. Some of you, many of you, have come a very great distance. There are representatives from, I think, more than 25 cities here tonight. I'm, I'm very glad to be with you. I hope we have a chance to speak together. And if we don't, that what I have to say begins conversations that will carry on over the coming days. My thanks to Sandy Palmer for inviting me uh, to give tonight's lecture, among others, to Patrick Lim for being my, uh, my guide, my chaperone, the person who made sure I was here on time, and to Shira West for that very generous introduction, which I can only disappoint you with from now. So Nottingham is the city of my childhood. It's not where I was born, but it is where I grew up. I was here from a very young age until, until 18, when I left for Cambridge. And I haven't been back much. Uh, this is only the second time, I think, in 15 years. The first time I came back to launch uh, Nature in Mind, which I became patron of, which was a mental health charity working with homeless and socially excluded people in this city that's left a long uh, and important legacy here. Uh, I lived here for nearly two decades, but strangely, and for reasons I haven't quite been able to articulate to myself, I have hardly written about Nottinghamshire. That is not to say that it's not present in my imagination. I would never have written Underland if I had not been brought up in Nottinghamshire. This city, this county tunneled its way into me. It left some deep set, deep sunk marks. I grew up near coal mining country. I grew up in Halem, a little village, not a, not a mining village, but close to mining country. That was the landscape of my childhood, the headworks and the slag heaps, I was aware of walking above stories of space that extended beneath me. Oh, there's a lovely echo of the blessing coming in there. So, uh, My father was a respiratory physician. He treated miners with industrial diseases. He showed me their x-rays as he held them up against the window pane as a, as a light box at home. I saw into their lungs. I saw what mining and the underworld could do to people. And of course, I went to school in the city of caves. And it was impossible to live through all of those things without inheriting an interest in both the abysmal and the wonderful things that the underworld had to offer. Nottingham was also where I met the English teacher who first lit the flame of excitement in me at what words could do and the conjurings they could carry and the spells they could cast. And that teacher is here tonight. He's Gary Martin sitting on the second row. And he taught me Seeing Things by Seamus Heaney, a couple of years after it was published. I think Heaney's arguably Heaney's greatest collection. And there's a line in that collection which says, I waited until I was nearly 50 to credit marvels. It's a beautiful line. I didn't have to wait that long because I was taught by Gary, because I had an extraordinary childhood here, and I credited marvels from a pretty young age, and I'm very, very grateful for that. So for all these reasons, I am profoundly, deeply glad to be here celebrating Nottingham's status as UNESCO City of Literature and the broader Notwich Summit with tonight's lecture. I've been given a very generously open brief, but I have been given one task, which is to explore in some way how culture and literature might speak to one of the UNESCO goals, Global Goal 11. And that reads, how literature and culture might strengthen efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. Um, I'm a storyteller, as well as a teacher and a theorist, and I guess sometimes a scholar, and a parent and a fool. Um, I don't have long. I was meant to have 40 minutes, but some of that's gone already because we're running a Ryanair-type uh, time uh, delay already. <laughs> Uh, and also, I've used up three of them already. So really, I'm only going to speak to you in haikus. Actually, that's not quite true. I'm going to tell you two stories, and I'm going to see how those stories might speak to that UNESCO goal. And the first of those stories, I'm very conscious I'm under the gaze of a slightly strange and tawdry Robin Hood up there, uh, <laughs> gold and bedizened with, um, with fairy lights, uh, for reasons unknown to me. Um, but under his greenwood gaze, I'm going to call the first of my stories, How the Trees Learn to Speak to One Another, capital letters all the way. And I'm going to call the second the story of the forest that began to vanish. One is predominantly a story of nature and the second predominantly a story of culture, though of course, as we all know, those two categories tangle with one another in unfathomably complex ways. 
So this isn't going to be a homily, and it's going to require you to make connections between what I am saying. Those connections are entirely up to you. Indeed, the voluntary making of connection is really the subject of my lecture storytelling tonight. To a degree, I'll be making these stories up as I go along, because that's what stories do. They have their own wild life. They have, to adapt a phrase from Dylan Thomas, their own green fuse force. And that cannot always be banned or bidden. So I don't know quite where we'll go or where we'll end up. There's that very famous first line of Joan Didion's The White Album, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. I think that's true, but I always think it's important to revise that a little and remind myself and other people that we also tell ourselves stories in order to kill and to hurt. Exclusionary nationalism is a very good example of a harmful, potent story being told very well at the moment. A good story is not always a good thing, but it is almost always a powerful thing. One of the characters in Richard Powers' magnificent recent novel of Trees and People, The Overstory, writes that the best arguments in the world won't change a person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. Well, I'm not sure I quite agree with Richard about the impotence of arguments, but I do agree about the importance of story, to persuade, to dissuade, to speak to hearts, to change minds, and wildly to create relation. Okay, I want to move to my first story, but first of all, I need that little widget down there. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick Lim QC. <laughs> the story of how the trees learn to speak to one another. In the 1990s, this amazing forest ecologist called Suzanne Simard encountered a puzzle, and the puzzle went something like this. She was planting or helping to plant Douglas firs, which are basically crop if you're a forester. And among the Douglas fir saplings grew paper birch saplings, which are basically weeds if you're a forester. So what do you do with weeds? You weed them out to improve the health of the crop plant. But Simard noticed something strange, which was that when you weed out paper firs, paper birches from among the Douglas firs, the Douglas firs don't thrive more, they fail more. How can this be? How can it possibly be that removing competition from a habitat results in the decline of the isolated or privileged crop species? Well, she wondered if there was a connection of a kind between these saplings. But what was its basis? Where did it exist and what did it make possible? So she began to inquire with her team. They used tools to peel back the forest floor. Some of those tools were genetic, some of them were uh, microbiological, and others were just um, digging. And what she found was that there was a remarkable community existing between individual trees. And she found that there was a structural basis for this community. And the structural basis were, was this. These are mycorrhizae, and mycorrhizae is itself an entangled word that unites the Greek words for root uh, and for fungus. So mycorrhizae are the hyphae of fungi that move through the soil and that then interpenetrate with tree roots. They enter tree roots and they create a cellular level interface. So they fuse, if you like, with those tree roots. Fungi are amazing searchers, questers, quarriers. They're miners, really. They spread out enormous lengths of hyphae through the soil looking for resources. Where they don't find it, they fall back. Where they do find it, they use it and increase their spread. There can be up to seven miles of a fungal hyphae in a tablespoon of forest soil. It had been known for a little while that mycorrhizal mutualisms existed, but Simard began to wonder whether there was more to this strange interface than just a sort of cosmetic forest detail. And so she began to wonder whether there, this might be the basis of the explanation for the mutualism, apparent mutualism, between the firs and the birches. And so she began to dig into this question. And she came up with a brilliant experiment, which was to allow carbon isotopes, which had been made radioactive, to be taken up by certain plants in her forest. So they entered the trees, and they should if the network didn't exist, have stayed in those trees. But she found those carbon isotopes moving around the forest. 
They were not moving by aerosol because they were already in the trees' systems. They were moving by means of the mycorrhizal network. They were coming down the trees' circulatory system, going to the root tips, and then at a cellular level, passing into the fungal network. And from there, they were being transported underground around the forest, and they were moving to other trees. And this was the revelation. The revelation was that here was the material basis for a system of communication, of resource reallocation, and of something that we might want to call sharing between trees. It was a beautiful experiment, and it revealed a beautiful thing. She writes, the fungi and the trees had forged their duality into a oneness, thereby making a forest. And she published this research in 1997 in a groundbreaking paper in the journal Nature, where it gained its now famous and I think brilliant nickname of the Wood Wide Web. <laughs> what Simard and her team had discovered was actually an incredibly ancient mutualism. We know that trees and fungi have been sharing with one another for at least 400 million years. We know this because in the equivalent of a stone photograph, which I guess we might call a lithograph, there is a fossil from 400 million years ago which has recorded the interpenetration of root and fungus beautifully and given us that fact from that great age has shown it to us across deep time. Um, I should also point out that traditional ecological knowledge, by which I mean forest-dwelling indigenous communities, had known about tree mutualisms for e forever. It's self-evident to them. Their stories carry this truth. Their metaphors, their grammars of animacy respect and recognize the fact that trees talk to one another. They have a social network. So I'm always wary of calling Western science uh, a, a, a force for discovery, because quite often it's revealing what has been widely known all along, just not converted into the language and the structures of Western science. Nevertheless, this was an astonishing discovery, and she began a research field which is still burgeoning. Some of you may have seen on the BBC News last week that this map and this map were published again in Nature to worldwide interest. And these are maps of the arbuscular and ectomycorrhizal fungal networks operating within world forests. This is really a map of relation, communication, and resource sharing um, within the world's forests, up in the tundra and down in the rainforests. It's a, a beautiful, beautiful document of, of, I guess, yes, connection. There's a wonderful phrase for fungi that I came across. China Mieville, the writer, told me. He, he calls it the, the kingdom of the gray. He says fungi are so alien, so utterly other, we cannot even begin to make sense of them. And of course, we can't. We have no knowledge of what this network is really doing. We have all sorts of readings of it. What interests me is the sense that we have made of it. And since the discovery of the network, it has become a very powerful metaphor for good relations, for the ways in which independent entities might share resources with one another to the betterment of the community, to a wider and more connected and networked good. Of course, that's just a form of anthropomorphism, and there are other ways of reading the network which find it to be far more competitive and individualist. But for the time being, I am drawn, and I want us to be drawn tonight, to this story of tangled mutualism. I love this photograph. It's actually taken up near Inverness. Uh, it's in a plantation, but that's where Simard began her, her research, so that seems appropriate. But I wanted to put it in front of you so that next time you are in a park or in a forest or in your back garden, think of what trembles under your feet, this skein of relations that is allowing connection and communication between the plants and the trees. There's a lovely phrase by the anthropologist and sort of mycologist Anna Tsing. She says, next time you walk through a forest, the essay is beautifully called How to Love a Mushroom. <laughs> next time you walk through a forest, look down. A city lies under your feet. 
Well, from that city below the ground, that subterranean urban space of connections, I turn to my second story, the forest that began to vanish. And that story takes place in a city above the ground. It takes place in this city, the city of Sheffield. And I want to see if I or you can begin to connect some webs, to send some hyphae shooting out and conjoining and tangling with the roots of this second story of mine. We might think of the first story as being about the wood wide web, and this second story, indeed this whole gathering, as being about the word wide web. This story begins once upon a time not so very long ago, in Sheffield, a city of trees. It sits partly within the Peak District. It has, or had, around 36,000 trees in the city proper. Some of them are everyday plain trees. Some of them are standard trees, beautiful trees. It has a Huntingdon elm. We don't have many elms left in this country because Dutch elm disease arrived here in 1976. To see a mature elm is still, to me, an astonishment, a glorious encounter. And this Huntingdon elm has a colony of rare hair streak butterflies in it for good measure. There are wonderful oak trees. There are the Rivendon limes. There are World War I trees that were planted as memorials to those lost in the war. It's a beautiful city, but after a while, these started to appear on the trees. Yellow tapes and other kinds of marks. They appeared because in a multi-billion pound contract signed in 2012, Sheffield's Labour Council had agreed with the multinational construction giant AMI for up to 17,500 street trees to be cut as part of a vast highways improvement scheme that was being undertaken in the city. And so slowly the forest of Sheffield began to vanish. It vanished tree by tree at first and no one really noticed because if a workforce turns up on your street and takes a tree away you probably think the tree was sick and some of the trees were sick or you think it's obstructing the pavement in a way that makes it impossible for people with mobility issues to pass by. That was the case with some of these trees. But they began to go, and sometimes they went in number. A team would turn up and take several trees at once. The team would go up, top the tree, take the branches off, gradually bring the trunk down to the ground, and then eventually what would be left of the tree in the street was nothing, chips. Here's one of the trunks coming down. And in here, you can see the constituents of the interior of a tree. I'll just give you the basic vocabulary because it's a rather lovely vocabulary. This is the bark, of course. This outer ring of paler wood is called the sapwood. And the red stuff, the innermost core, the stuff that's hardened most, that's called heartwood. And we'll come back to heartwood. People were going to work in the morning and coming home to entirely different streets said Paul Selby, a city resident and a leading member, as it turned out, of the Sheffield Tree Action Group, also known as STAG. It was ecological destruction carried out in secret by a multinational company with the explicit support of the local authority and the police. It was a very strange and disorienting time, and I want to give you a word. The word is solastalgia. Some of you will know it already. It was coined by Glenn Albrecht, the Australian eco-philosopher. And he was looking, he was working with communities who were being displaced by mining and by drought in New South Wales in Australia. And he realized that there was an experience for these people which, for which there was no word. Their experience was of being, um, being moved without going anywhere. They were losing their home landscapes without going anywhere because of the changes that were happening due to climate change or large corporate action mining around them. He said, this isn't nostalgia, because nostalgia is what happens when you leave somewhere and you come back, or you're away from it and you long for it, a period of time or a period of space. He said, we need a new word, and his word was solastalgia. So this was the pain that comes from seeing your home change to unrecognizability around you. This was a version of solastalgia. 
I think, that was happening. Cherry trees in full blossom were coming down. And so a, a resistance began to declare itself, express itself, discover itself. And at first the resistance was commemorative. Here's the heartwood, here's the sapwood, here is the flower laid in commemoration of the tree that was gone. People were angry, said Paul Selby again. These trees were part of their lives and they didn't want them going. These weren't anarchists or activists from other towns. They were Sheffielders, furious they hadn't been given a voice. So they came out and they fought to be heard. It was about democracy, about who gets to say what happens in your streets, but it was also about human and more than human relations. Who gets to say what happens to your trees, not that they're your trees. It was an amazing resistance. These were people who were not campaigners. These were people who didn't want to be standing out in cold streets, locking their arms around the trunks of threatened trees, getting arrested. They were everyday folk who wanted to get on with their lives with their trees in their streets. And a coalition of dissimilar people appeared. Here's a familiar book some of you may have noticed. Um, here are the hearts with messages on them being hung around one of the named trees. The protesters began to name trees, Vernon Oak among them. Um, they wanted the roads fixed, but they wanted the trees kept. Was it so hard? It was a creative protest. Songs were sung. Uh, cake sales were held. Vigils from uniformed young men who had never fought in the First World War were held under the threatened trees that were going to be cut, that were the memorial trees from the First World War. WhatsApp and Facebook groups were created, the World Wide Web working for the good here, whereby any protester could alert the community resistance group to the arrival of a felling team at any tree, and they could get people to that tree fast. There were people from many kinds of backgrounds, many kinds of ability, and many kinds of age. People started taking the bus to work, leaving their cars, blocking access to endangered trees or streets. But then the fight became pretty grim. Uh, special police units were brought in to break up the pickets. Arrests were made and legal fees mounted up for the people defending themselves. There were pre-dawn raids, a 73-year-old great-grandfather was detained for intimidation. Charges later dropped. He described himself as the least intimidating person I've ever met. <laughs> um, a 53-year-old was charged, charges dropped, for tootling a vuvuzela in the general direction of a policeman. Um, there was an attempt to portray this as a middle-class protest. Uh, it wasn't. It really cut across all sorts of lines. And one of the things that gave the lie to that was the amazing support given by a man some of you may know, Magic Majid, who was the legendary Lord Mayor of Sheffield, who arrived as a refugee from Somalia into the city in 1994 and was brought up in Burngreave, one of Sheffield's most economically deprived areas during the early 2000s, and who, among other things, ran the, half, the Sheffield Half Marathon dressed as a tree. Um, they began to draw in other people to their protest. They managed to get Bianca Jagger on side, Jeremy Corbyn, sort of, uh, and Jarvis Cocker. Um, I think if I had a fight going on, I'd probably want Jarvis on my side. But by this time, five and a half thousand trees had been felled. They also drew me in. Many conflicts come my way. They come all our ways. Um, they come my way more now I'm on social media quite so much. Most of them I can't help with. But this one just seemed to me so obviously, emblematically, metonymically, profoundly wrong. For a lot of my writing life, I've been paying attention to the ways in which small communities resist greater forces. I've written about the Norwegian resistance to big oil drilling in pristine waters in Underland. I've written about the islanders of Lewis and the Outer Hebrides and their resistance to forms of large-scale development of their moorland. A lot of these represent disputes where power seeks to represent as worthless that which is held to be subtle and valuable by local communities. Sometimes power is right. Not often in my experience. 
I also love trees. I just love them. I love street trees. I love all the things they do for us. I love what we chillily call their ecosystem service provision. They give us shade. They clean our air. They help keep our streets cool. They also store carbon. They're the best tool we've got for that, really. Uh, they also store memories, and they also lift hearts. I think of a tree, each tree, not sentimentally, as a small civilization. It supports many kinds of life. Um, they're conjoined by their hyphae to other plants and other trees, and together these thousands of small civilizations in a city make what we call a city, along with all the other forms of connection that go into a healthy conurbation. So to strip them out as so much street furniture just seemed to me wrong in many ways. I was also heartened as well as appalled by what I saw in Sheffield because it seemed to me that the campaign was doing extraordinary things. This attack on the trees was actually creating communities. It was sending hyphae shooting out and entering the roots of other lives, other people. It was allowing them to share knowledge, resource, stories, passions. It was actually activating and animating the city in extraordinary ways, even as it was at terrible cost. I wanted to know what I could do. Writers are useless. I mean, they're really just good for nothings. That's how I felt. I wasn't on the front line. I wasn't risking anything. I cannot do much apart from put words end to end and turn them into sentences and then put sentences end to end and turn those into paragraphs. Anyway, it's boring already. Um, so I wrote. Of course I wrote because that's what writers do. I wrote a poem that I imagined as a charm against harm and it was called Heartwood. And it partly came about because of this photograph. Not that one. Oh, that's a lovely one. This photograph. This was one of the felled trees. Oh, I'll just go back. Stay. Here is the sapwood, and here is the heartwood. So I wrote a poem, and I'm going to read it to you now, because strange things happen to it. Heartwood. Would you hew me to the heartwood, Cutter? Would you leave me open-hearted? Put an ear to my bark, Cutter, hear my saps mutter. Make my, mark my heartwood's beat, my leaves flutter. I'm going to have to walk to read this. I'll bring this with me. Am I still on with this? Are you able to follow me with this? Brilliant. OK. I am a world cutter. I am a maker of life. Damn it, I can't read it. That's really bad. I'm so sorry. My eyes are poor and the pixelation is bad and I don't know it off by heart. But it's okay because you're going to hear it in an extra... Oh, I can read it off there. That's a good idea. Let's see if that'll work. Yes, brilliant. I'm going to start at the beginning. Would you hew me to the heartwood, Cutter? Would you leave me open-hearted? Put an ear to my bark, Cutter. Hear my saps mutter. Mark my heartwood's beat. My leaves flutter. Would you turn me to timber, Cutter? Leave me nothing but a heap of logs, a pile of brash. I am a world cutter, I am a maker of life, drinker of rain, breaker of rocks, caster of shade, eater of sun. I am timekeeper, breath giver, deep thinker, cutter. I am a city of butterflies, a country of creatures. But my world takes years to grow, cutter, and seconds to crash. Your saw can fell me, your axe can bring me low. Do you hear these words I utter? I ask this of you. Have you heartwood, Cutter? Have those who sent you? Thank you. Uh, and thank you for that save. That's great. I'm glad you could hear that. Um, I gave this poem to the city of Sheffield. I gave it to the tree protectors. I gave it to the tree protesters. I said, you can do whatever you want with this. Um, you don't have to credit me. You don't have to ask permission from me, ever. I gave it to my friend, the artist Nick Hayes, and he cut this astonishing lino cut to make it into a 
broadsheet protest poster in the old style. It's a beautiful, tender piece of work which recognizes that these jobs weigh heavy on the cutter as well. I wanted by giving it to repudiate the brutal causal logic of the contract, which was really the structure behind all of this, the bottom line of the contract. And what happened when I gave that poem to Sheffield was a surprise to me. It began appearing in windows, first of all, just pasted up as a form of protest. Then I gave it to Jackie Morris, who made The Lost Words, and she began to play with it, and she turned it into a tree ring version of itself. This is her beginning to play with it. Here is the full poem. Don't try and read it, because what happens is your head unscrews. <laughs> And then all of your heads will fall to the floor simultaneously. It'll be terribly messy on the 90th birthday. Um, this was turned into a talisman, a charm, that was printed on plywood from renewable sources and was hung around people's necks. Here's mine, visiting the Huntingdon Elm. It was also, of course, hung around trees. It became a protective charm. It was then worn by all the protesters who were the public face of the negotiations when they brought the council to the negotiating table. They went in with the Hartwood talisman around their necks. Um, here it is on the Huntingdon line. That's what a uh, elm, I beg your pardon, that's what, an, uh, that's what the elm looks like, that beautiful, unmistakable elm green. Um, it was also set and sung. It was set and sung to music by Corrine Polwart, the great folk singer. It was also set and sung by a community choir in Sheffield. A Charm Against Harm. And this is the first page of the notation, because they devised something rather wonderful with the notation. Now, you may notice these signs here. You don't see those normally on musical notation. And what the, each of those represents is the beat of the singer's hands against the singer's heart. So they kept time as they sang this song under the trees by beating their own hearts. And that sounds painful. It wasn't. It was beautiful. It was a, it was a timekeeping, and it was a wonderful thing. We sold prints. We've raised more than £8,000 now for the Legal Fighting Fund, people buying prints of the Hartwood spell. And then in November, something odd happened. Five-foot versions of the poem began to appear in... Uh, shall we say, illegal places. Um, bus stations one night suddenly, bus shelters suddenly found that they were filled with copies of the Hartwood poem. It's called Subvertising. I have absolutely no idea who did it. Couldn't possibly tell you. It was nothing at all to do with me. Um, and they drew new audiences to the poem and to what was going on in the city. Uh, I want to say... There is no heroism here on my part. The heroism was on the part of the protectors and the protesters. I gave this work, it entered the creative life of this protest and it just, it became part of it. It did lend some energy, it lent some hope and hope is the fuel in the tank of change. The sap in the flow, and maybe I'd be better off saying, of a long, attritive campaign like this. And a new vigor sp spread through the campaigners. They got support from Gove, support from Corbyn. None of it made much difference, but then the felling stopped. The pressure had got too much. The felling was halted, and eventually the council was brought to the negotiating table. And meanwhile, the World, Wide, the World Wide Web helped to set the World Wide Web in motion, and Hartwood was being translated into other languages, Indian languages, Gujarati, Urdu. It was being used in tree protests in Delhi and other places, and the ripples or the branches of the Sheffield protest were finding their echoes, their reach in other tree protests who were reaching out by social media and making contact. And I thought, because it's such a beautiful speaking and setting of the poem, that you might like to hear the Telugu translation of Hartwood, which was made recently as part of a campaign. You can find the um, petition on my Twitter feed if you want to find out more about it and sign it to resist the felling of a thousand banyan trees in near Hyderabad. And it was translated by the resistance group there. And the translator is Nagamani Prathapa. Here's one of the felled trees on that highway. And here is her setting of the poem. And 
I'm going to play you her reading it now. And it's the most incredible, tympanic, percussive, beautiful speaking of the spell. Patsani gunde. Nariki nariki kutti kutti. Niluvetu na kulustava. Chetulu narike vorana. Nariki nariki kutti kutti. Niluvetu na kulustava. Chetulu narike vorana. జరపదిలంగింటె జరపదిలంగింటె కొమ్మరెమ్మల ఘోష చెక్క ఎనుక చెమ్మ ఊపిరి కొమ్మరెమ్మల ఘోష చెక్క ఎనుక చెమ్మ ఊపిరి ఇనుస్తది ఊరన్న అసుంటి నన్ను కలపగ కుప్పలు చేస్తావా అసుంటి నన్ను కలపగ కుప్పలు చేస్తావా నాదొక ప్రపంచం నాది ప్రపంచం నాదొక ప్రపంచం నాదీ ప్రపంచం రాయి నిరిచి ఎండవాన కాచి నీడనిస్త రాయి నిరిచి ఎండవాన కాచి నీడనిస్త కాలాన్ని దాచుకుంట స్వచ్ఛమైన గాలినిస్త కాలాన్ని దాచుకుంట స్వచ్ఛమైన గాలినిస్త ఒక అండనవుత జీవరాశులకు తోడునవుత ఒక అండనవుత జీవరాశులకు తోడునవుత ఎదగడానికి ఏళ్ళు పడితే కూలడానికి పూట చాలు ఒక్క గొడ్డని వేటు చాలు ఎదగడానికి ఏళ్ళు పడితే కూలడానికి పూట చాలు ఒక్క గొడ్డని వేటు చాలు జర పదిలంగిను నీ గుండెతో నా గుండె చప్పుడు ఓరన్న జర పదిలంగిను నీ గుండెతో నా గుండె చప్పుడు ఓరన్న Well, thank you. Thank you to the amazing translator and speaker of that. <clears throat> I'll just give you one detail from the translation. Patsani Gundi literally translates as green tree beating heart. Uh, the other word for heart, Hridayam, didn't have the same dynamic element. And I love that innovation of green tree beating heart. So in, in a week, they'll be holding a protest festival of culture, of poetry, of readings, of theater, of dolls of charms under the banyan trees for the villagers who live with those trees. Sheffield did it. They brought the negotiators to the table. They agreed a kill list. They agreed the trees that could come off that list and eventually those that could stay on. Negotiation happened. Entrenched positions were moved away from. And it was a remarkable victory of culture and commitment and belief and something like grassroots or maybe hyphal roots movements. And The Lost Words was part of that. You've seen the way it entered Nottinghamshire, it entered Sheffield too, and I went to meet the teachers and the children there. There was a campaign there. The book has ended up in every primary school in the city. The children coming from many, many language backgrounds were working to translate some of these words into their own languages, their community languages, Arabic, Russian, Bengali, Kurdish. Parents wrote down acorn spells for their children in Arabic. And it came to seem to me that the trees had grown the city and that that was a reversal of the usual ways we think about trees. We think about them as crops, we grow them, but actually I think they grow us. And this June in the City Museum in Sheffield, there'll be a huge exhibition of all the children's work in response to the lost words and to the trees of Sheffield. I'm going to detain you for five minutes longer and then stop. Um, I think it's important I keep going because if I ended my stories there, they would seem too pat to me. They would seem like stories which told of culture's great possible work. I do believe that, but I think that Representing that as the only story is too easy now more than ever. We are right now in trouble, deep trouble, deep Anthropocene trouble. We live at a time when what Michael McCarthy has called the great thinning of species is at work. Biodiversity loss, collapse is occurring across the planet due to human activity, all our activities. It expresses itself at local levels, in communities, in languages, in hearts, in well-being, in mental health, and of course it expresses itself at vast planetary inequalities brought about by 
what Rob Nixon calls the slow violence of climate change. What can culture do in the face of such emergent and systemic difficulties? It's tempting to despair. I know people who are, I think, hipsterishly post-hope. They call me a, not a hophead, but a hopehead. They say I'm high on hopiates. Um, they do have good lines and quite good puns, and I haven't yet been able to come up with one to come back at them, but, but I also think they're wrong. I think it is important to fight shy of big overclaims for culture's power. Culture often does nothing. It becomes a kind of auto-backslap, a self-flattery carried out by people who work in the culture industry like all of us. Um, but I also think that we need hope in the dark. We need it more now than ever in this age of crisis. The post-hope argument doesn't convince me. What makes me despair is resignation. It's self-indulgent. Barry Lopez puts it strongly and clearly in a recent public event. Your ethical responsibility is to others, not to yourself. Hope is not a requirement, but faith is indispensable. Make common cause with others. And that nails it for me. However grim the global picture, there are always battles large and small to be fought and won for the good. There's discourse to be changed. There's power to be resisted, there's inequalities between humans and humans and humans and more than humans to be balanced out at very local as well as at very planetary levels. I was delighted to see that Nottingham has set out a clear plan to become the UK's first carbon neutral city by 2028. I was delighted to see that both Nottingham University and Nottingham Trent have, as I believe, moved officially to divest from fossil fuels, as have Edinburgh, Stamford, New York City, all of Norway, but not Cambridge University, my university, one of the oldest universities which should be showing leadership in this respect, but which has only now, after being dragged back to the table, agreed even to look at a costed plan for divestment. Culture has a part to play in all of this. David Attenborough, Blue Planet 2, we've seen how a remarkable document put together by a conspiracy of culture, literature, science can affect legislation across the globe as Blue Planet 2 has done. We've always been good at imagining the end of the world, but what's harder to picture, says Rebecca Solnit, are the strange sidelong paths of change in a world without end. These non-linear scenarios of change, these wood wide webs, these word wide webs, these world wide webs, these are the ones we need right now. And for that, we need many kinds of storytelling. So I hope today I have thought a little about how stories, languages, names can affect the way we think about our more than human world, this green fuse force of which we're part. How these things can be crushed to insignificance by big power, but also how they can sidestep it, grow underneath it, and in this way bring about kinds of ethical, educational, or societal change that might, moving quietly like hyphae, through grace and gift and generosity, far exceed their intended scope and force, and help us to imagine how we might start to exit the Anthropocene and enter the Symbiocene. Thank you very much. Just for me to thank Robert for that incredibly eloquent and evocative set of stories. And, and, and just to say, yeah, I, I lived in Incliffe, near Incliffe Park in Sheffield uh, when there was one of the pre-dawn raids where one of the trees was cut down and uh, people were arrested, elderly people were arrested. And it, so it spoke to me personally in terms of the story that you told about that. Um, Robert is going to be here to sign some of his books, I think, for a little bit. And I think rather than turning this into a question and answer session for such a, 
amazing lecture. I think probably it will be better if we retire to the to the bookstall and people can speak to Robert and talk to him about his ideas on a more personal basis after this. So can I just thank you again for such a brilliant lecture and, and giving us so much to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you.